All right, so this talk is uh, Intro to Virtual Reality Audio. Um, I'm Brian Hook, I'm the audio engineering lead for Oculus. This is Tom Smurden, he's our audio content lead. <clears throat> the goal of this talk is to, as you'd guess, give you a quick introdu introduction into what virtual reality, reality audio is. Um, a year ago, no one really had any idea and probably a year from now, talks like this won't be necessary, but we're in this awkward transition period where we're going from kind of the 2D audio space to VR audio, and a lot of people are trying to understand both the technology and the tools and processes that take us from one to the other. So the talk is gonna be split into two parts. The first is me talking about the technology, and the second will be Tom talking about kind of the content changes that um, he's learned over the past six months or so working on our new VR audio technology. <clears throat> so first off, this talk is greatly simplified. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of nitty-gritty technical details. It's, um, if you're interested in a lot of the bigger details, this is a somewhat simplified version of a talk I've already given. Uh, if you search on YouTube for Oculus Connect Audio, you'll be able to find that talk. Um, it's an hour of just me talking about a lot of the low-level kind of technical underpinnings of what VR audio is like. So this is, this is where we are today. <clears throat> Displays have been improving. When we think about VR, we were thinking about things like head tracking, positional tracking, uh, lenses, display density, things like that. But what we don't really think about too much is audio. As audio guys, a lot of us are already used to that. But the nice thing is that it's changing. So in the past, audio has been mostly ignored. You don't get much in the way of CPU budget. It's always brought in at the very end of a project. Uh, you couldn't really standardize on output hardware. You didn't know if someone had headphones, if they had really crappy desktop speakers, or if they had a really nice 5.1 setup. So with VR, the playing field is somewhat being leveled, and it's time for us to catch up. So the first question is, why is audio actually important for VR? I mean, what makes VR so special where people have argued that audio is really important for 20, 30 years of making games? What is different now? The first is that it really enhances the perception of space, distance, and size. It makes a massive difference. It helps really glue a scene together as well. So when you have that, the visual imagery there, when you have audio that just feels perfectly right, it really helps a lot, which goes to our kind of one of Oculus's key things, which is that sense of presence. When you put on a headset and you put on your headphones, you want to feel like you're actually there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about localization. And all that is is the ability to predict the position of a sound source based on nothing but audio. So this is how human beings hear something and can detect where it's coming from. Using only two ears, we can localize many sounds with about one degree of resolution up front, about 15 degrees of resolution to the sides. But this is possible using only two ears, which if you think about it, shouldn't actually be possible. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how humans actually do this. So the first thing is figuring out the direction from which a sound is coming from. Laterally, we have a couple different uh, techniques that our brains use. The first is we listen for the time delay between low frequencies. If a sound is coming and we hear the low frequencies from the left a little earlier than from the right, then we know the sound is probably coming at us from the left. Uh, for high frequencies, we listen to level differences. High frequencies tend to get masked a lot easier by our heads using what's called head shadowing. So if we hear more high frequencies on one side than the other, that's usually an indication that the side with uh, more high frequencies is where the sound is coming from. That gives us left and right. Now, for elevation, things are a little bit more complicated. We rely on our brains a lot more there. What happens there is that we have filtering and reflections from our ears and our body. So when a sound is coming from above us, it's bouncing off of our shoulders, it's coming into our ears from above, and it's hitting different parts of our ear geometry, which creates a different uh, set of filters. We also rely on head movement a significant amount as well. Head movement is a, something that's going to keep coming up when we talk about VR. The ability to have head tracking and the ability to just change our heads uh, lets us really narrow down where a sound is coming from. In the case of elevation, we actually use head cocking. So if you actually can't tell if a sound's coming from above or below you, what most people do is they turn their head a little bit, and if it sounds louder in the ear that's above, that got aimed towards the ceiling, then you know that the sound's coming from above you. Front to back is kind of the same thing. It's pinna filtering, the pinna is the, your outer ear. 
we, uh, because the back of our ear is kind of a cup shape, it will mask out frequencies for sounds that are coming from behind you. So a sound coming from behind you is going to be a little bit more muffled. Our brains interpret that as a sound actually coming from behind you. And again, you can turn your head to kind of narrow it down. You hear a sound, you're not sure if it's in front of you or behind you, you just turn your head and that really helps you kind of localize it. So that gives us the direction, but now we need to figure out how far away a given sound is. The one that's the most obvious is the perceived loudness, but what isn't as obvious is that actually only works for familiar sources. We all know what volume a uh, standard person who's standing there talking to you is like. We, most of us have a general idea of what a car sounds like and how loud it should be. So when we hear those sounds, we can kind of make a guess, given how loud it is, how far away it is. If it's an unfamiliar source, however, you, you just don't know. And sometimes you'll encounter this. You'll hear a, a building siren or something like that, and you can't tell if it's coming from the house next door, if it's coming from three miles away, because you just have no frame of reference. Um, initial time delay, that one is really hard to describe and actually does need kind of visuals, but really what it comes down to is when a sound hits your ear, you're actually hearing a series of sounds. You're hearing the sound, the direct component, but then you're hearing reflections. Based on the interval between that first sound and then the reflections, that gives us kind of a good idea, um, an approximation of where this sound is relative to other surfaces. We use that information to also make an estimation as to the distance of a sound. The mix of indirect and direct sound is another big one. For you audio engineers out there, that's sort of like on your reverb, you have your wet-dry mix. Um, it's been an age-old thing for 50, 60 years in the recording industry. If you want to push something into the background, you give it more reverb, and that's exactly because human beings work that way. Motion parallax is when a sound is traversing very quickly, that is our way of indicating that that sound is actually probably pretty close to us. For a sound to move very quickly across our sound field, it has to be moving incredibly fast if it's far away, or it just needs to be very close. So that's why a, a, a fly buzzing right by your face, we get a good idea that it's actually fairly close, not just because uh, we're familiar with what flies sound like, but because it traverses that distance from your right ear to your left ear so quickly. In our oral level difference, that's simply the volume difference between your ears. If there is a very large difference between how loud a sound is between your right ear and your left ear, for example, that means the sound is probably very close. If the sound difference is, almost, is very negligible, it's probably a lot farther away um, and a little bit louder. Another minor one is high frequency damping. High frequencies uh, in air tend to get damped um, not as quickly as a lot of people would like you to believe, but it makes enough of a difference so that distant sounds tend to have fewer higher frequencies. So why does all that matter? So localization is how do humans hear a sound and figure out where it's coming from. Knowing that, we can kind of reverse engineer that into what's called spatialization, which is I have a, a monophonic sound, and now I want to make someone believe it's coming from a certain spot. So, We've all done this before. In the olden days, uh, we used panning to do left and right. We, if we cared about front and back, some people would apply a um, low-pass filter and as the sound got behind you, and it would kind of sort of emulate that. For distance, we would use volume attenuation. For elevation, you didn't have anything. That just, that was a no-op. And you had no head tracking to help. So no matter how well you tried to spatialize a sound, all it took was a guy using uh, fixed speakers and turning his head, and it would blow uh, the entire illusion. So today we have head tracking assistance. That's a huge step up. That makes one of the biggest differences right now in making VR audio possible. For distance, we use attenuation. We also use the direct and indirect ratio, which is the wet-dry mix I mentioned before. And for direction, we use what are called HRTFs. There we go. So HRTFs, they're head-related transfer functions. There is a ton of literature on this stuff, um, even demos, the virtual barbershop, things like that, that kind of give you an idea that it actually works. A lot of people are um, very skeptical about HRTFs. You, you get that idea that it's not actually possible to work, but it does, in fact, work. And all it does, without getting too technical, is it encapsulates a lot of the psychoacoustic elements of localization by measuring it. So you put microphones in the subject's ears and you take some reference audio and you play that audio and you record what happened to that audio 
on the way to that person's ears from every direction. Once you know that, you can apply that to other sound sources to make it seem like they're coming from those directions. This is based on measuring human subjects. Um, and on the very last point there, I talk about customization and personalization is still an issue. And that's one that is a lot of active research into right now. What we do right now is that there's well-known publicly available data sets from human subjects, and we just kind of sort through them and find the ones that sound like they work the best for a large group of people. And of course, head tracking, I, I keep coming back to this point, that's what makes this practical. Because even if you use a data set from someone who's totally unlike you in terms of head geometry, with head tracking, if a sound sounds like it's supposed to be coming from here, but it's actually to you coming from over here, you can at least turn your head a little bit and everything just, you, you can start really focusing on exactly where that sound is coming from. Head tracking is huge. I keep coming around to that. So HRTFs theoretically could work without headphones, but they are pretty much impractical unless you're using headphones. And this means that realistically headphones are the future. You are not going to do successful, popular VR audio without requiring headphones. That's just the reality we have to accept at this point. A lot of people are not happy about that, but that's just what the new technology entails. The reason for this is that headphones support head tracking, and I keep coming back to the head tracking again. With headphones, um, head tracking just magically works. In addition, depending on the headphones, they can isolate the listener from the environment, and that gets back to the presence, the sense of immersion that we talk about in VR all the time. So future stuff. So far, I've only talked about sounds and the listener. Um, there's other aspects there that I haven't touched on because it's ongoing R&D from universities and from other companies. For example, things like incorporating world geometry and how do we get the uh, reverb, the reflections, the occlusion, things like that actually working. And what happens as a result of this is that we've created a tension between realism and authorial control, um, which Tom can talk about a little bit more later. And that is that, you know, as engineers, we want to model everything as realistically as possible. As content developers, we want that maybe as a basis, but then we want to be able to tweak it after that, just like with film or anything else. Um, another area that has not been explored as much is also uh, area and volumetric sound sources. So that's, it's a, I, I don't want to say it's a minor thing, but it's something that you don't really notice until you've been doing this a while and you realize that certain sounds just don't sound very natural because they're all kind of these pinpoint tiny um, sound sources. All right, so yesterday we announced the Oculus Audio SDK preview release. Uh, I don't know if you guys caught that. And that is part of our effort, Oculus's effort, to make VR more widespread and available for everybody, VR audio. And this is what it consists of. So we are providing plugins for FMOD, WISE, and Unity um, on a different set of platforms. You'll have to kind of download it and see if the one that you're interested in is supported. We We'll eventually have available what's called OVR Audio, which is our low-level C and C++ SDK. Uh, that's on Windows, Mac, Linux, and Android. It is not useful to most developers. Um, we use it as the basis for our plugins, but the reality is, is that content development of audio these days involves using a lot of tools. We are not providing those tools, uh, but other developers are, and we just want to make sure that FMOD, WISE, and Unity have high-quality 3D audio, and you can use those tools. We're providing VST preview plugins as well, because as Tom discovered, when you're trying to create sounds, having to tweak a sound and then jump all the way back into the game and then back out and then back in makes it really difficult to get a good mix and to get a good idea of the, the, how good the sound actually spatializes. We do have uh, Apple AU and the AAX plugins planned. Uh, we don't have a timetable for those. But uh, if you're interested in those, just let us know. We have, uh, now there is an Oculus Audio Forum set up. So if you guys are interested, go subscribe there. You can ask questions there. Um, I will be there, Tom will be there, and we'll be able to answer any questions there as well. So of course the question is, why do we have this SDK? As I've tried to emphasize throughout this talk, <clears throat> for VR to succeed, everyone needs good audio. We as a company want VR to just take over. We want everybody to use it. We want everybody to like it. Since audio is such a huge component of that, we're making this SDK available. It provides high quality baseline 3D audio. So that means that you can take this and just get something good, reliable, that works. 
and we're making it free. And again, that's that thing of we just want people to use it. And because we want people to use it, we're saying you can use it everywhere, not just for VR. We don't want a situation where you guys are thinking, we want to put in VR audio, and we want to use Oculus' stuff, but oh man, it only works with Rift. So what am I going to do for my PC game? What am I going to do for a game for another headset? We're sell telling you, just use our stuff. We don't care what you use it on, because the important thing is that VR has to sound good no matter what platform you are on. That said, third-party solutions are fine as well. Our goal is not to you know, push out people who are trying to develop this stuff as third parties. It's just to ensure that you as developers have kind of a, a safe, reliable solution that's low cost and broadly available to turn to. It establishes a baseline. And that's uh, pretty much it for the tech. So I'm gonna hand it over to Tom. Um, he's, like I said, he is our lead audio designer, and he's the one who's had to deal with a lot of this stuff um, kind of on the ground without a lot of guidance initially because we've been all kind of discovering the stuff as we go on. So, all right, I'll give it over to Tom, thanks. Okay, hi everybody, thanks for coming out. I know it's early and a lot of people were at audio stuff late last night, <laughs> I'm watching Twitter. Uh, so we're gonna go over a few things that I've learned in making the Oculus demos. How many people here have seen the Oculus demos so far? Okay, a few of you. Okay, so I'm gonna use those examples as what I've learned and go over the different things and what makes uh, 3D audio work really well. So first of all, I'm gonna start off with sound design and immersion. And first of all, spatialized audio works best with visual re reinforcement. So if you hear a bird right in front of you and you look and you see it, great, it's there. You hear a bird behind you, turn, and you see it, that's great. I saw it, I heard it, I know it's there. If you hear, turn, hear a bird behind you, that's neat, and you don't see it, it doesn't reinforce the audio's there, so visual reinforcement really helps out. Um, I know we're not used to that, because I've done many ambience loops, just you put birds in the area, you don't have to see them. Visual reinforcement will really sell 3D audio more than what we used to use before. Um, also, one of the bad things I've learned is avoid stereo ambient loops. So let's say you see a street in front of you and you just put an ambient loop on that street and you're used to doing that. I mean, we've all done this for games. This is how we make ambient loops. It sounds like you're in that space, but you have headphones on. So as you turn, everything turns with you and it's just not very realistic. It's not immersive. Um, I'll get into it in a bit, but we do everything and build all of our ambience from, from small mono loops. Um, also, emitter placement is crucial. Uh, I'll show you our demo. So uh, here's our T-Rex. Now, I've worked on a lot of stuff. Sometimes on bigger games, um, bigger objects and games, we will show, put the emitters in different places on it. But a lot of times, the emitter just goes on the root. So all the sounds are coming from the root of that creature. In VR, you have to make sure to put all the sounds where they belong. So the, the voices come from the mouth, the left footstep sound comes from the left foot, the right footstep comes, sound comes to the right foot, and you have to do this for everything. Because people get around, they'll get on their hands and knees. I've seen crazy things happen when people have the helmet on. And you've gotta make sure those sounds are coming from the right spots. And that really helps sell the immersion as well. Okay, mono wind loops. So, vertigo. So we have a demo where you're standing on the edge of a building and you're looking down and a lot of people freak out. You see them white knuckle, it's fantastic. Um, so we use a lot of mono loops. And so what I did with this, so you can see there's two wind, mono wind loops, one in front of you, one behind you. You're where the blue arrow is and there's also a small, tinier wind loop in the center. So what's going on is there's a wind loop here, a wind loop here, and then as you turn your head, it sounds like the wind's rushing around you. When you go to the edge and look down, if you're brave enough, the wind will sound like it's rushing up in your face. So this is, how, this is a really simple uh, way of showing how we have to build ambiences from now on in VR. It's not stereo loops anymore. Okay, sound design for making actual audio. Make the audio how you want it to sound, of course. Um, but make sure everything is mono. Uh, HRTF that we're using, it is a filter. So when the sound comes through, it's gonna sound a little funky. It puts notches in your audio. It's okay, just it'll sound fine in context. Those notches will change as you turn your head around. And don't try to dial that out with EQ. It's like, oh, I lost like, you know, 4K or whatever. I'm gonna get that back in. Don't do that. That'll take all the spatialization out of your audio. 
Um, wide band sounds sound better with high frequencies. Uh, just because what we're used to, you know we have a subwoofer. It's in one space. All of our mids and highs are left and right speakers, rear, behind you. So all that stuff like helicopters flying around, jet planes, that's where you'll see a lot of demos with these wide band sounds with high frequencies going around you. I know we don't have control over, well, not a lot of control of what's gonna go into our game, our project, um, but just try to dial up those frequencies more when you're really trying to localize when that's gonna be a focus point for you. Um, also a thing we have is there's possible artifacts with fast moving objects. When you're doing bullets, you really don't wanna do sounds on each bullet. Uh, you're gonna hear it from the, where it's fired and then you're gonna hear when it hits and we really want the zooming by you. Try to make, don't try to make slower bullets. Just, uh, I'm thinking more like bees flying around you are easier to do. Um, if you see our demo, the Audiobot demo in it, there's a wizard battle and there's spells casting back and forth. Those are going pretty fast. But you can hear as they, as they zoom past you. We're working on that, hopefully it's gonna be better soon. Okay, mixing. Okay, cool thing about 3D audio is that it gives you verticality. So when you're, we're all used to mixing on a flat plane. We've got stereo, 5.1, 7.1, everything's around you, except for people that have been working with Atmos lately. Uh, verticality is a new thing. It's fantastic, it opens up all this space in the mix where you have things behind you, above you. It just, the above you thing is so fantastic and below you, it just gives you all this more space that you didn't have to deal with before. Um, avoid busy mixes, all this means is you're gonna be in control of a lot of the focus of the player for VR. Um, so if somebody's talking over here, you don't want like a bee buzzing behind your head because the player will turn around and look at that bee. They're not gonna stay focused on what they need to be seeing and they'll miss some things that the experience is trying to provide for you. So keep a few main sounds spatialized. That being said, it's okay to do a bunch of ambient sounds all around you, like if you have wind blowing around, that's fine, that's a lower level. If you have like traffic, like on bridges in that vertigo, there's traffic on one of the bridges and there's traffic down below, there's trains going by, that's all fine because that's not the focus. The focus is there's balloons floating around too and so you'll turn and look at that stuff. Um, but that fills in the space really nicely. But it's, it's great to have multiple mono loops all around you and just keep the focus, the higher level sounds, uh, make sure you don't have too many of those. It'll just confuse the person who's experiencing it. Um, Audio is even more powerful in VR than it was before. Everybody knows that we control the emotions in games. Uh, be careful. Like I said, the small audio cues can't distract the player. You want people to look at what they're supposed to be looking at. Okay, mixing's totally different now. <laughs> it's not like what you're used to. Uh, this was a big step for me and it's gonna be a big step for everybody. Uh, a lot of old surround rules when you're working on cutscenes where never make the audience turn around, keep the focus on the screen. In VR, uh, the focus can be anywhere. So if there's a guy talking over here, you gotta look over here. If there's a giant mastodon charging towards you, you wanna look at that. That becomes the focus. If it's behind you, then the player turns around and that's the focus. Uh, content dictates the player focus. Also, uh, old rule for cutscenes is dialogue goes in the center channel. Well. There is no center channel. Sound comes from sound sources. So, somebody's talking once again, that becomes your center, and you have to realize that. And whenever the new focus is with the head tracking, that's gonna be your new center. It moves all around you. There's no center uh, for anything. Um, and so just work with your designers and artists on where they want the attention to be in the level, and make sure that you're all joined together figuring out where you should be looking and where the focus should be. Okay, music. Music is kind of funky. So sometimes straight stereo mixes, just piping the music in, sounds fine. Sometimes it sounds like you're in this experience and you've got your headphones on just listening to music. It doesn't fit because it's not spatialized. Um, it can't take you out of the experience. But sometimes it's okay. I haven't figured out the difference yet, like what, why sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, on the Audiobot demo, uh, I worked with Jason Graves and we did for the orchestra, nine different sections of the orchestra, we place them all around you in a circle. So as you stand in there, if you lean different directions, you can hear like, here's the string section, here's the horn section, percussion's back here. And it's kind of neat, and you kind of feel like you're in that space, it just really encapsul encapsulates you. 
Um, experiment with what works best. This is out there now, try out stuff. Let me know what you're finding works best. I want to spread this information out and I want a lot of people testing these things out because this is all new. With the head tracking, everything's different now and we have to figure out what's, what's the best way to deal with this. Okay, tools. Our plugin is working, like uh, Brian said, for Wise FMOD and Unity. When you have a sound in there, uh, there's two quality settings. There's HQ, which is high quality, and then there's fast. The difference is, is the high quality sounds have early reflections and reverberation on them, and that's what really helps with the spatialization. The fast is for direct signal only. Um, that's your less important, that's more of your ambient sounds you put in fast. The ones you want the real focus on and really need to spatialize, use high quality in. Okay, our early reflection is based on a shoebox room model. So it's basically a shoebox around your head, and you can go in and adjust the size of the room that you're in. You want to keep it actual room size that you're seeing. Um, this really helps with the spatialization because when you hear a sound and it bounces off a wall, and then you hear it, if you're trying to make one sound and the room size is a different sound, it sounds kind of funky and it doesn't really work out. Um, if you're doing an outdoor experience, we also, well, what I'm getting to add, it was, uh, there's also adjustable reflections per surface. So if you're in an all metal room, turn up those reflections, it'll bounce around. But if you're outdoors, turn down the reflections on all the walls and on the roof, except on the ground, and then it sounds more outdoorsy because you're just getting the bounces off the ground. Here's what this looks like in Wise. Um, as you can see, there's your reflections and your room size. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to set up and get going. Oh, and everything is controllable, controllable by our TPCs too and wise. Okay, late reverberation. So when I'm doing a mix, I like to put everything in the same space by putting a reverb over it. Uh, convolution will work for this. I've been using the wise convolution reverb. Um, but you have to think how convolution reverbs are made. They're sampled from a single location. So it works well if you're not moving, but once you start moving around the space, convolution kind of falls, falls apart on you a little bit. Um, hopefully it's something that'll be coming up in the future and we'll get a better way of doing this and uh, different, see what different reverbs will work better. Okay, uh, another thing, I, I insisted with these guys that we have plugins for our DAWs because I want to be able to make the sound, the whole soundscape and build it in Nuendo or whatever tool you're using and listen to it and see what it's going to sound like before you export it into Wise and before you get it in game and test it all out. Um, it looks like this and it just gives you a couple different places to put positions where the sound's going to come from and then you have your uh, early reflections and your reverb. It's really nice to use and uh, it's a, just a great way to test everything out and it saves a ton of time. Okay. Another thing that uh, Brian was talking about was realism versus controlled. So as a sound designer, I like to design sounds. I'm just trying not to emulate reality. But sometimes you want to emulate reality. We're going to do both. It'll start off, the plugins will start off set up, so it'll just be re very realistic sounding. And then you can tweak it however you want it to make it sound, like the more imaginary sounds we want to do or hype things how we want to hype things. Okay, so a lot of what everybody knows still applies. However, this is really, really different working with VR audio. I mean, it's, it's just mind bending how different it is to do a mix and to build soundscapes this way. Um, there's a lot of new stuff to learn. Hopefully, once we, this is out, well, it's out there now. Hopefully everybody will get to play with it and figure out what works best and I'll always be available to help people out and we'll see what we can come up with. Um, one of the toughest things we have right now is evangelism because it's always hard to get companies to try, like to say, well, we're doing VR, but we also need 3D audio. They're saying, ah, 2D is good enough. 2D is kind of neat because with the head tracking, people are like, I can hear the audio, it's fine. But you're, you're missing out so much without using the 3D audio. Um, there's a lot to relearn. Uh, hopefully, all you guys will give it a try now that it's free, and uh, I hope everybody enjoys it. Uh, and we're ready for any questions now. Thank you. So, any questions? Yeah. Who said? Okay. Hey. Yeah.
can you go over a little bit more about your, your pipeline? You talked about the, the preview tool in the doc. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about your, your general pipeline of creating a sound, previewing a sound, getting it in the build, testing it in the build, et cetera? Sure thing. Thanks. So, that, uh, what's that? You mentioned it's unreal as well. I don't think we talked about that. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so, for testing things out in the DAW, I think it was just the VST oh, plugin. Oh, just the VST. Okay. So, so, right now we have VST plugin, and you'll set it, you'll just put it as an insert on a channel for the sound. And then you can dial in the direction. There's two different ways to do directions. You can do just X, Y, Z. And so I'll set it up. Like, I know this sounds like, uh, for the audio bots, when I did the, the room all around you with all the different, the nine different instruments, I just dialed them up and I set them all around me in different spaces, each instrument. You do an insert on each channel for each uh, mono insert you want to do, each mono, each mono instrument. And then you just dial in and around you and you listen to the headphones and then you can tell if it's going to sound good or not. Um, I was messing around with verticality in there, just dialing stuff up around. You don't have the head tracking, but it is a, it's a good way just to test things out. Once you set, uh, the way it's set up now, once you set up early reflections in the first one, that'll copy to all the other plugins so everything has all the same early reflections and room size. Sure. Thank you guys, it's really awesome to have this, these tools. Um, uh, I had a question about the shoebox, um, is that do you, is that scalable as you kind of proceed throughout the level and things change or? So right now it's set up as a RTPC, so you can change that. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with WISE. Is that set up in FMOD? Um, I do not know. Okay, I, I believe it, if it's not set up in FMOD, it will be set up in FMOD, so it's controllable. So you can change the different room and the different experiences. Right now, uh, I'm using Unreal, so I use Blueprints to just adjust the RTPC of the room size for the different experiences. Um, and if like the, room structure changes, is that thing changeable? Like you, this room explodes into a huge, you know, yeah. auditorium yeah. or something. Um, those things in real time, are they, are the shoebox is changeable? I have not messed yeah. with, is it changeable in real time? Yeah, it's, you'd incur a hit in performance when that happens. So just, and we didn't talk about this that much, but just as a point of reference, so we have uh, all the, the demos that Tom worked on were Unreal based and used WISE. Some of the other stuff that you guys might have seen on the show floor, um, the, the Hobbit uh, one and Epic Showdown were Unreal based and actually used our C and C++ SDK directly. And we also have some Unity based ones. So what's gonna happen is some of the things that Tom's talked about or I've talked about are gonna be a little bit different on each implementation. So um, what happens? Cool, um, last question. Um, with, do you use any two, it, in your experiments, has any 2D audio worked? Like, if you're trying to have a room tone, how would you? No, room tones that? are the same thing. It's it sounds really weird. It follows your head around. Yeah. So room tone, like you can place uh, just uh, emitters somewhere in the room to fill it up, like yeah. multiple ones. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It, yeah. Anything that's stereo, it just, it sounds really off. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thanks so much for this. this is Fantastic! It, it sounds like you've completely, or we are about on the verge of a major, another major disruption of uh, a film and game audio, which is kind of fun to think about. Um, this isn't so much a question as maybe for you guys to elaborate a little bit more. The issue of music, to me, seems to be a huge yes. unknown for this, because obviously as, as game sound designers specifically, we have to deal with that. And, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I like your notion of spreading the orchestra around, but frankly, that sounds just completely arbitrary and artificial. And, you know, in a film, you've got underscoring, right? And sure. you know we have this suspension of disbelief that the sound is coming from the composer, right? It's the storyteller. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, unless it's coming from the radio or whatever. So could you just elaborate more on the music question? Sure. I, I'm still not sure. Um, I'm, I'm trying it out. Uh, in the Weta demo uh, with the smog and everything, that's just a stereo piped in. To me, that worked really well. That felt, it felt like a movie. Uh, it just, it felt right to me. But I've done other demos, like for our mirror room, it was weird uh, in our demo. It's just, there's a mirror that's in front of you and then you see your uh, face and the face changes. It's going on and all it is was like a, just a stereo track in there. And it just never felt right to me because it just felt too attached. Uh, with, art, with HRTFs, audio always sounds farther away from you. With headphones, which is a straight stereo mix, everything sounds like it's kind of in your head in headphones. So you could possibly, I did a, you could possibly try putting the stereo, maybe using HRTF a little bit far, farther out from your head. 
that will still follow you, but it might be set it more in the space. I think it's going to be a very creative decision, and it's something people are going to have to have to exper just experiment with and see what works best. Thank you. Sure. You're going to run into the same issues as well with like UI. Yes. So any, any UI, in-head narration, things like that, things that we're used to having kind of just piped directly into our skulls in a VR environment, it, that may sound good, or it may sound totally weird to have a control panel where the beeps are in the middle of your skull. Uh, speaking of headsets, um, have you guys experimented with any different types of headsets, such as uh, headsets that have multiple physical speakers, or such as like a speaker at the back or top of your head? I have not messed with anything like that. Um, no, I haven't. Uh, this actually works really well. Um, I used to work at recording studios a while back, and I had a friend of mine who was a tech come over and try out uh, the Crescent Bay. He took it off as soon as he was done with it, and he starts trying to peel the, the cover off the speaker to see if there's multiple speakers in there. Because yeah. he was convinced that there was like vertical speakers, and like, then I'm like, dude, no, it's only two speakers. <laughs> yeah, you know, and if you think about it, you only have two ears, so you, it is possible to do all this. Um, we have messed with some of the, uh, oh, what's the name of the? The sub pack. The sub pack. Um, I, I have met, messed with those, that's really cool. Uh, one really cool experiment that we've messed with is having a subwoofer with open back headphones, and that'll really, like, just feeling the vibrations and how it shakes your entire body, it's really nice. That's like, it's not a reasonable home setup, <laughs> to have somebody with headphones and just a subwoofer cranked all the way. But uh, the sub pack works pretty good. Uh, you can feel all the vibrations on you, and there's a wearable one as well that was kind of a neat sensation. Yeah, the mobile sub pack yeah, as mobile well. Pack, yeah. And there's a couple others like butt kicker and mm -hmm. yeah, things like that. Cool. All right. Great talk. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you. Hey, how you doing? I'm, uh, I'm James from Pixel Router VR. And in our, in our game, it's a rail shooter, and every level starts with a musical soundtrack that the level is built to. One of the things I'm most excited about here is these VST plugins, because I'm thinking, have you tried using these as just channel inserts in a stereo mix to like do your music for the level using these spatialization plugins to sort of spatialize in the DAW? So uh, if you do it that way, you won't have the head tracking. It'll still follow your head around. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of it, it dried out. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I've been thinking about that for a long time. But seriously, I found that just using the fast without the room reflections on the music yeah. uh, setting is, is the way I've been doing it. Because it, yeah. it's, if you think, I look at it as like if you're going to a movie theater and the screen's in front of you and all those speakers are set and music is there playing. Mm -hmm. But as you turn your head, the music is still moving with the screen. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the difference. Once again, it's anything that's stereo is attached to your head, and it still and it takes yeah. you out of the experience. Well, one thing that I'm excited about with it, though, is I put all my stuff on SoundCloud. You know, if, if you make something to be played out in clubs or something, it seems like a whole new set of tools just for standard music production. I've wanted a spatializer for a while, and it sounds like this could work just for straight music production. So yeah, this is all you kind of need it in headphones. Okay, it doesn't it really work. work on a, a speaker system too. Yeah. Well. All right. Cool. Okay, Thanks. Right, thank you. All right, thank you guys. Uh, this is a good segue into this question, which is a lot of games are on both Oculus and a traditional screen with a speaker system. So um, in terms of like how much degradation is there to a traditional mix when it's going through HRTFs, and what solutions do you foresee for games that are on both Oculus and on speakers? It's, it's going to have to be a different mix. Different mix um, just good. because the way you set up all your ambiences is going to be completely different. It's just, it, it doesn't carry over. Um, okay. It's all about, the, like I was saying, those mono sound sources. And so when I, was, when I used to do regular games, I would have like stereo loops or quad, you know, for just for the ambiences. And those, you could set it up, like do the same thing and set it up, but it still doesn't sound right because you want verticality and things in your ambiences. So it's, it's just going to be a, a mix, and the, I think the ambiences are going to be the big change. OK, so would a solution be to have that be an option in like the settings that the player can pick, like if you're playing on a VR? That's, is that pretty much the only thing? Yeah, yeah, I think that would be the best way to go Thank with you. it. Thanks. Morning, guys. Thanks for the talk. Um, I come from the film space and had the opportunity to mix a couple films in Atmos, which, as you know, is a object-oriented um, platform and what I love about it is that it sort of preserves some of the traditional aspects, uh, the performance aspects of mixing 
is there any thought being put towards how to bridge sort of um, more traditional mixing techniques in a three-dimensional space the way Atmos has? No. no. <laughs> but th this is, Atmos is really cool, and it, and it does some, some of the same things, but with the HRTF, it's, it's so different because everything has to be the mono sound source for the HRTF to work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've been trying to, I've not messed with Atmos personally. I've watched a few videos of how it all works. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done a ton of cut scenes over the years, and I used to work at studios where they did that. Um, so I know the basis of everything, but like I said, this is a huge mind shift for everybody. For sure. uh, and it's just a different way of working. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to require, basically, is that companies like Dolby, Fraunhofer, DTS, um, all the traditional media and audio companies are all aware of what's happening with VR, and we're kind of relying on them to bridge and figure out how to go from targeting cinemas and, and stadiums and things like that to targeting VR experiences. For Oculus, I mean, we just don't have the bandwidth for that, so what we can provide is the raw technology and a lot of the exploratory stuff in terms of sound design, but we, we expect and anticipate that all the big companies, hopefully in the next year or two, will have uh, really solid end-to-end -end solutions to do exactly what you're talking about. Gotcha. Um, I'd be surprised if, if they didn't because they're just going to be kind of left behind if they don't. Right. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thanks for the talk. Um, I had a question about the HRTF function, and if that is, that's on a per voice basis, like per Correct. sound. And what kind of performance do you guys get on that? Like, how many simultaneous sounds? Um, it depends point? on the platform. So on PC, I mean, we can, on our fast path, we can hit, you know, 100 plus. On mobile, I mean, it gets a lot sketchier just because that's how mobile is. But, uh, you know, a, a few dozen on mobile. OK, and another question, the, the HRTF, does that also modify the phase of the sound per ear, and is that something that is detectable by your ears? I know that you had like there were like five uh, things that we had up here on the board that said like you know I think it was attenuation and like the delay from one right. ear to the other. Phase is definitely something that people pick up on, and that's actually one of the things that depending on the HRTF implementation, they will actually incorporate the phase difference as a way of telling left from right. All right, thanks, guys. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, I was actually going to ask the same thing about performance, so I'll ask something else. Uh, All right. So um, with the fast, you just mentioned there's the fast, or mm -hmm. what's the other version? The high quality. High quality. What's technically different between the two? Like how much changes between them? Um, and uh, yeah. So the main difference is that the high quality uh, path has the shoebox model with the reverb and reflections in it. Mm -hmm. And that really makes a tremendous difference in, in the sense of uh, place of something. The fast model only has the direct component in it. So you can tell where it's coming from and you get a good idea of roughly how far, but with the high quality one, you get a very precise sense of like that sound is like right there. The fast, it's like the sound's kind of over there, but it is a huge performance hit. Great. And then um, for other platforms, I mean, you said this is free for everyone to use, which is right. awesome. Um, of course, I'm assuming you're supporting PC for development. What, you know, if people start using this for other things, uh, you know, if they want to make a GameCube game or whatever, you do some, anything, you know, any type of game, mm -hmm. can, is that stuff that they can port this code to different platforms? Well, so the code itself is not being released, so we just have the, the canned libraries right, that are right. available right now. Um, whether or not we release the code later is kind of under discussion sure. at this point, because, we're, again, we're not super invested in keeping this as some proprietary thing. Okay. But the main thing is that releasing, anytime you release anything open source, it, it becomes just a huge support mess for the three months mm -hmm. around that release. And we just don't want to deal with the distractions right now. Cool. But yeah, in theory, I mean, in fact, someone just posted on the audio forums about like, how do I get this working with the Dolphin emulator? And I'm like, mm -hmm. dude, <laughs> like, you're on your own there, man. Awesome. All right, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Hey, guys, thanks for the talk. Uh, have you ever tried anything, thinking about linear, let's say, not a video game experience, but uh, a VR movie mm -hmm. or something like that? Yes. Have you ever tried the binaural uh, mics, the one with eight mm -hmm. channels with the ears and all that right. stuff? How would that work inside the system? That's a good we, question. We shouldn't, be using, <laughs> we shouldn't be using the HRTF thing. Correct. So that's, um, that's actually a really big mess. 
Uh, right now, there's this huge area that we're, we mostly work with the games and interactive experiences that are computer generated. The stuff that you're talking about, the, like the 3D IO, things like that, um, with the binaural recordings is just, it's, I don't want to say it's a disaster, but it's bad right now because everybody's kind of coming out with their own solutions and they're coming out with their own very narrowly focused solutions. Like you have some people coming up with uh, microphones that let you capture multiple channels of binaural audio, which is interesting, although it doesn't give you head tilt, but there's no one who's coming up with, say, software to post-process and edit that exactly. and do That's sound the... replacement. Uh, for a movie, it's even worse. Uh, th I mean, this is a huge problem. So for a movie, you have a situation where you put a VR camera, like a jaunt VR or something, and maybe you put lavalier mics on your actors, but now how do you track their positions in space as they walk around so that you can do the proper 3D audio so that later when you want to dub it in Portuguese, you can. And that's, I mean, it's not that that's hard. It's like literally no one has a solution right now. They haven't thought that far ahead, which is a byproduct of this, this being such a new industry. Thanks. Thank you. Hey guys, I had one more question. Uh, about the delay uh, between the scene and when the audio reaches your ear, mm -hmm. like what, what's the, like the maximum amount of delay that would be possible before you start to like have a disconnect? Kind of like, you know, there's some certain techniques that are done to mediate that visually, you know, like fix up the frames right before they're displayed based on your head movement. Is there any, like... So, so which delay specifically are you talking about? Uh, well, like, let's say you have a, you know, a 15 millisecond uh, delay in your pipeline. Oh, okay. Right. Is that perceivable? In it depends on the content. Like, humans are actually really good at latency compensation for audio, except in certain areas. Um, for example, lip syncing. So if your lip syncing is off by... 70 milliseconds, it's noticeable. If it's off by 200 milliseconds, it's just you, it, we've all been there, you know, you're watching a TV show and the, the audio is off by 250 milliseconds, it's, it feels almost unwatchable. Mm -hmm. But if something else is off by 250 milliseconds, um, like a car driving by and it lags by 250 milliseconds, you, you can kind of adjust to that. Okay, I guess more concerning would be like the spatialization if you're turning your head. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of research on that. Um, part of it is because you, when you're wearing an HMD, you tend not to whip your head around because you're aware that you've got this thing on your head. And so as a result, people tend to look like this as opposed to moving their head as fast as a person can. If you're moving your head slowly, then 40 milliseconds of latency is totally fine. And that's kind of the number that we've generally heard thrown around is 40. Okay, and is there any, so with all this extra compute that's gonna be required to do VR audio, is there any, like, uh, have you guys explored, like, moving the audio onto the GPU or, or anything like that? Yeah, we're, we're looking at stuff like that, but thankfully most of this stuff, at least on our fast path, it, I mean, PCs are really fast. So, um, you know, we're not even burning an entire core right now. So if we get to the point where we have to kind of figure out acceleration methods, we'll definitely explore that. But today we found that most people, the, even doing the really cool high-quality audio, it, it doesn't kill your CPU by any means. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Hey, guys. Um, I was wondering if you tried sort of programmatically or sort of at real time driving the parameters of your shoebox model or whether you just basically used it as more of like a preset thing. So I haven't. Okay, yeah. I, ha I haven't not done anything real time. Our demos are different locations, so I'll switch it in between, but yeah. it's something that I was like, I have to try, but I have not, I have right, not okay. messed with it yet. Cool, and did you say that you had sort of filtering on the on the ref reflections which are in no, the shoebox? There's no filtering. Just, there's no just, filtering. Okay. It's just straight reflection. So one thing um, we didn't really talk about is that, so we're, this is VR audio, but that's more than just games and it's more than just experiences. So some of the things we're really excited about seeing are actually, um, uh, are there any amateur like DJs in here? Okay. Um, so you take something like Ableton Live um, or your favorite or, or Bitwig Studio or something like that. Now think about how you would be able to use something like that in VR. So there's a lot of opportunities there just in terms of music making an experience, um, creating experiences that you can share with other people that are really exciting to, to think about. I don't know if any of the big companies are actually delving into that right now. But as audio people, you know, start thinking about beyond games, beyond experiences. 
how can I, as a DJ, for example, get up, I mean, might be dorky looking, but I mean, dead mouse wears a big mouse head. So, I mean, if you're wearing an HMD, it's, you're actually not quite as goofy looking. Um, so if you're up there with an HMD, maybe you're sitting there doing all your stuff in a little VR world, disconnected from the audience, but maybe there's an opportunity there for performance tools, for example. The flip side of that is maybe you're not an amateur DJ, but you really wished you were uh, an actual famous DJ. So maybe there's the rock band equivalent of DJing or anything wearing an HMD. The flip side of that is maybe there are experiences you can put out for VR if you're a musician to let your audience experience you remotely, for example. So there's beyond games, um, I mean our focus is obviously games and interactive, uh, interactive entertainment, but beyond games, uh, we really need to start thinking about just the incredible experiences that you can do using VR audio that go beyond, you know, laser light shows. Because that was like the first thing everybody did is they, you know, loaded up their favorite tracks and then they added visualizers and you kind of had like 3D Winamp going. And, which is cool because you have to do that first step to get to the other stuff, but now it's time for us to move on to uh, the other stuff. So, all right. Any more questions? That's it? All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Thanks.